Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always my co-host, Nick Filato. We had so many questions, which is awesome, by the way. Thank you all for sending them in on the latest mailbag that we had to push forward to mailbag part three. And that's what today is going to be mailbag part three. It's the off season. Now, uh, obviously we have this week in between the super bowl chiefs and Eagles. Unfortunately that we didn't talk much about those games, Nick, but that's something we could talk about at some point as well. Maybe later on down the week, down the line this week, more content will be coming after this mailbag this week. We have a few things in mind. We don't want to say them right now. We're still formulating our plans. And the Senior Bowls, obviously, this weekend. We'll be talking about that, a recap of that next week. So, okay, let's dive right into the questions now. We'll start here with Alex Buston, who asks, with 11 draft picks in 2022 and a coming 11 in 2023, and yes, the Giants will likely have 11 draft picks after two compensatory picks. They're going to get one for Lorenzo Carter, and I'm not sure the other, but they're expected to get another 11 picks for this coming draft. What would be a realistic number of players to hit on with these 22 total picks? Dan, you've mentioned in the past that the draft is about uh, wanting as many chances as possible, as many dart throws. And I know you need to hit on some of these day two and day three players, but what is a realistic number? Well, you hope that you're going to hit on all your first round picks, <laughs> which is something that the Giants haven't necessarily had the most consistency with in recent memory. But those day two and three picks, you need to be contributing starters. Even early day three, you want them to be contributing starters. Now, the back end guys, they can be special teams players. Ideally, you want them to hit, but isn't always necessarily the case. If you look at guys like Carter Coughlin and Cam Brown, those guys were drafted in the sixth and seventh round back in 2020, and they have been key contributors to the Giants special team since they were drafted. I would consider those draft hits at that juncture of the draft, right? But in an idealistic world, you want them all to hit. That's more than likely not going to happen. So I would say at least half to be above average contributing starters on your team is probably a desirable effect with the other guys being key contributors and role players throughout the roster, depth pieces, people who can spell Leonard Williams and Dexter Lawrence players along those lines. But it's unrealistic to expect every single draft pick to hit, unfortunately. Yeah, the NFL has tons of busts. Even as Nick said, in the first round, you can find busts. Second and third round, expect the third round is in a round where everyone's like, oh, that's a good value round. A lot of third round picks are busts. And that's part of the reason why some people were, you know, open to trading picks like uh, the third round pick that the Giants traded for Leonard Williams a few years back. I will say this. I personally think on day three is when you should start targeting the Trey Smiths of the world, the Moan Clarks, the guys who are injured and falling draft stock because they're injured. Because you can even look at guys like Carter Coughlin and Cam Brown. And are they really successes? Yeah, they're playing a lot of special team snaps, but the Giants special teams is terrible. So how much of a success is that really? You're going for basically a special teams only player when you're drafting both of those guys. And I know I'm sure at the time both regimes thought maybe Carter Coughlin could do something um, as an edge rusher, a situational edge rusher, Cam Brown was playing a very positionless position at Penn State, was long. Maybe he could have developed, they were thinking. But in the end, there were a lot of special teams reasons for drafting players like that and players like that in the past. Uh, Joe Judge was a big special teams guy. And then you have a special teams unit this year that's one of the worst in the NFL, despite having these guys playing a lot of snaps. So I don't know if there's much gain there. And I do feel like you can find special teams players in free agency and UDFA. So to me, I would be looking at taking real good dart, real big swings with those day three picks a lot of the time when they present themselves. Players like the Damone Clark or, or the Trey Smiths of the world. Um, but as far as hitting, you shouldn't expect to hit on many starters, in my opinion, on day three. If you're, I think you're a good, a good team will hit on maybe one every year. That's like what a good team will do. The Chiefs have done that a lot in the past. They've hit on a bunch of these day three guys, but it's been like one a year. Trey Smith. I don't know if they hit on one this year, but they might have. I'm not. I, I, I don't know. Well, Leo Chanel's playing for them, but I don't know. He was day. He was the end of day two, I think. So, yeah, I would say maybe one per draft. I would say one per draft for the for the day three picks day as three. well. But I'll say this too, man. I think one reason why you might see a lot of busts in round three, as you brought mm -hmm. up, is a lot of teams will take chances around that point of the draft too on players who maybe have the upside to be round one picks, but they have character issues or injury concerns, right. a la eh, Owa Odigazua for the New York Giants. He had a lot of injury concerns, but there was a ton of upside with that pick, and he could never really get healthy enough in the NFL. So I think maybe that is one contributing factor as to why some of those round three picks end up busting. 
Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, Kenny Henderson Henderson asked, would you trade for Brandon Ayuk, T. Higgins, or DeAndre Hopkins, or do you plan to draft, or would you plan to draft a wide receiver high? What do you, if you were to trade for a Higgins, what would the cost be? Because I think he's my favorite target. I think Higgins and Ayuk, a lot of Giants people on the timeline talking about them as if they're going to be available. I don't see why they would be available right now. Both of those teams are in their Super Bowl windows. I know Joe Burrow just said that his Super Bowl window is his entire career, and that does make sense. But why trade T. Higgins when he is such a pivotal part of your football team right now when you still have him under contract? So I don't really think either of them will come available this season. If I had to choose out of those three, it would be T. Higgins. But I think the most likely route for the Giants is going to be spending maybe a day two pick on the wide receiver position, maybe the end of the first round. If the Giants love some of those players, it seems like a lot of them are more slot type of players, which Giants already have on this roster. And a Wandell Robinson, possibly Sterling Shepard, if he comes back. But I don't necessarily think that would negate the Giants from taking a, a receiver just because he is a quote unquote slot only guy. I just don't know if they would do that at 25 with all the other holes on the roster and with this specific draft being really deep at a lot of positions, but not necessarily a lot of top type of talent, I guess is kind of like what I'm understanding about this draft so yeah. far, even though I have a not not the firmest grasp on it right now. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'll answer it um, both specifically and holistically, because I think the holistic answer to this is an interesting one for debate among Giants fans. And I'm curious to get your take on it, Nick. But first, let's go specifically for me of those three, Kenny, it's Ayuk by far. And I really do think by far, I, I just watching these players look, I respect T. Higgins' game. I like T. Higgins' game a lot, but I think T. Higgins' game when I'm not necessarily sure it would translate all that well, all that fast with the Giants. I think part of what T. It's so good about T. Higgins is his ability to win on these 50-50 balls downfield. And when I watch them, when I watch the Bengals, I see a lot of really well placed balls downfield by Joe Burrow, and a lot of balls that are just kind of dropping right in. And I, I mean that that's good, but I don't see a lot of big like speed touchdowns from T Higgins where he's burning defensive backs, catching a ball and has 15, you know, five yards behind him between the next defensive back and him. And I see a lot of injuries with T Higgins over and over and over again with Ayuk, I see a player who wins really quick in routes has filthy route running really to me is just completely missed, not misutilized, but I think uh, Eric Crocker actually who we've, had, who we've had on the podcast, Crocky who breaks down, you know, draft with us. And then he covers the 49ers. I think to some extent he's basically said like, it's not even untapped potential with Higgins. It's more like unutilized. Like they're just, they just, Ayuk, don't, yeah. With Ayuk, not Higgins, yeah. right? It's more like he just hasn't had a chance to really show the world what he's capable of. That's how I feel. I think Ayuk is the best kept secret in the NFL from his ability to create separation, his overall speed. I think he has ball tracking skills that are really well, that are really good too. Good 50 50. But I mean, that's what he was coming out, right? He was a guy who they thought was more of like a 50 50 throw the ball up for him guy. And now he's proven to be an even better route runner. To me, I think he's a much better player than Higgins. That's just, or I would just say better because Higgins still is a great player. There's been some health issues. And I think Burrow makes him look a little bit better than, than some other quarterbacks might personally. Hopkins to me is a definite no. I have zero interest in trading for Hopkins. I've made that clear in pre previous pods. I'll say it again. I I'm not ever going to be in the business of trading for 30 year old wide receivers that you have to then give a brand new contract to. I think that's really bad GMing. I think it's a really bad way from a, a process standpoint. Maybe the result will work sometimes, but process wise, it's not good, especially with the window the Giants are currently in, which is not a Super Bowl window. It's still a rebuilding window. Yes, they want a playoff game, but then they got completely blown out by the team that went to the Super Bowl. That's not a Super Bowl window yet. They still, we obviously know all the holes they need to fill. Hopkins to me is a definite no. But holistically, Kenny, and I'm curious to get your take on this too, Nick, because I want to see where you stand. This is kind of the big difference, I think, with a lot of Giants fans and where there's a lot of a divide. A lot of fans do feel like no matter what, we're playing for the now, right? When it comes to re-signing a player like Saquon Barkley, no matter what, he was the big reason why we won in 2022. We have to re-sign him because we're thinking about 2023. And this kind of goes the same with the wide receiver question. No matter what, we have to find this wide receiver one in 2023. How do we do it? Do we get Hopkins? Do we go with Ayuk? Do we draft a wide receiver high? Do we trade for Higgins? But I'm just never going to be of that thought process. And I think Joe Shane and pretty much every good GM in the history of the NFL, unfortunately, I'm not saying unfortunately, but look, would probably agree more on the side of it where I lean. You have to look at this thing like a five, 10 year thing. You can't just look at it like we got to get these guys for now. These guys are going to give us the best chance to win for now. When you start to make those decisions, you start to lean further and further back into the Gettleman. 
The Gettleman is, we have to win now. The Gettleman is, we have this window. We have to get players who will win now. But you got to look at this thing long term. And I think Joe Shane will look at it that way. He'll look at it like, look, if I can get a wide receiver one this offseason, if something presents itself, if the 49ers call and they will, they want our first round pick and they'll give us Ayuk or the Bengals call and they want our first round pick, they'll give us Ayuk. Or in the draft, I see a wide receiver in round one who can be a wide receiver one that I love. He'll take one. But if not, he's not going to panic. He's not going to just say, I have to get one now. He could get one in 2023. He could get one in 2024. I know to us, it seems like, damn, can we really afford to wait that long? But that's the reality of the situation. Sometimes you have to wait that long. You have to let these opportunities come to you. You can't force things in anything in life, especially, you know, drafting or building a roster. And I've used the poker reference, but it's the same thing. After you lose a big poker hand, you can't just pick up 7, 10 offsuit and be like, I'm going to play this like pocket aces because you're just going to lose when you do things like that. This general manager is process oriented. I don't think we really have to worry about that. There's not going to be any huge panic moves. I think we already saw that in this season, right? Everyone yeah. was like, you have to go out and trade for a wide receiver. He's like, right. we'll just claim Isaiah Hodgins off the <laughs> Buffalo Bills practice squad. And he's going to be the most important offensive asset on your team, not named Daniel Jones or Saquon Barkley. So I think that is the direction that Joe Shane is going to go in. And I feel like we are in very good hands as giant fans with him leading this ship. Yeah, I agree. And I want to talk about something else you brought up with the slot thing. There are a lot of people who are talking about what you just said, like the Giants have to, no matter what, what they do, they have to get a prototypical, quote unquote, prototypical from a frame standpoint, wide receiver, uh, X wide receiver type. But I'm not so sure that's the case, right? Like you look at like some of the better X receivers over the last you know, decade or so. Antonio Brown, when he came out into the draft, no one was saying he was going to be an X receiver, right? Nick, people were going to be like looking at just frame base. They're like, this guy has to be a slot guy. He's going to have to move inside to the slot. And wh what happened? He won on the outside consistently with via his route running and via his ability to just win as a wide receiver off the line of scrimmage or, you know, at, at the top of his break. And I think there are players like that in this class. I starting to, I'm starting to study Zay Flowers a little bit. Have you seen any of his film or anything i haven't yet. watched him but i've yeah. heard very good things about it he's out here at the east west shrine game yep. in las vegas so he, it's i do not like the fact that the east west shrine game and the senior bowl are basically coinciding right yeah now. i think that's the stupidest thing too i don't really understand why they do that and i, I now, think the should... east west shrine bowl is like hey we are just as powerful as the senior bowl so oh, we're gonna get and they got top guys they have first round players it wasn't necessarily like yeah. that in the past right that's a good point as well um i don't know why they compete though i think that's pretty stupid they should they should obviously for their own sake, move those to different dates, but he's a player who I'm starting to study and I like, and I think there's, you know, you can't just look at these guys from a frame standpoint and be like, they can't be an X receiver. We have guys like this on the roster. You have to look at it. Like, can you project these guys to potentially win on the outside? Not based on how they look, but based on how they run routes or based on their traits and how they project the NFL. And so I think that's going to be something that I look at because I, I agree with you, Nick, as what you said first. It doesn't feel like there's any Jamar Chase in this class, Devontae Smith. Like, there's definitely not a top end type receiver in this class, in my opinion, but there could be guys. Jordan Addison, Zay Fires, that are that don't look that big and prototypical. And then you look at it like, oh, we already have a Wandell Robinson or whatever. But these are guys that would fit exactly what the Giants want to do schematically on offense. And so, I don't know, we'll, we'll be looking into that more. But I think overall, the key thing for me is I'm not force feeding wide receiver this offseason. I'm going to let it come to me. And I think Joe Shane will do the same. Yeah, I'm right there with you. And I can't wait to get into the draft because there are a lot of yes. interesting players and we will be right here covering all that throughout the offseason. Biased Giants fan asks, let's say Giants don't trade for anyone, rely on signing strictly free agents. Who are your top priorities and why? First, Dan, I guess I'll just say, Joe Shane has already made this clear. The top priorities right now are going to be players like Saquon Barkley, Daniel Jones. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to sign him, but they're going to prioritize keeping talent in-house. And that obviously includes Julian Love, and I think Nick Gates and Sterling Shepherds and players like that will also be factored into the equation. But just to go with what the uh, listener asked, who of the free agents really kind of are you attracted to right now? Yeah, I keep coming back to, and free agents, let, let me make one thing clear, bias Giants fan, we'll have a better grip and feel on this and we'll be answering questions on it or doing our own like separate podcasts that address it. 
of free agents in a little while, because this is the thing that, you know, you always hear every GM talk about when they, when they join podcasts or, you know, when they're in the media after they retire or whatever, after they're done GMing, they always say like, don't look at a free agent list now in, in January, because it's not going to look anywhere close to what it's going to be when free agency hits, because a lot of these players are already going to be re-signed by their own teams and that's going to change it. But there are a few players that I already have my eye. I think no matter what the giants have to make us a, a play at a linebacker in free agency. I don't think it's even to me. This is like, you know, you talk. I just talked about don't force feed wide receiver. I don't think they have any option but to force feed linebacker at this point. Unfortunately, receiver, you go into next year with a Darius Slayton, the Wandale Robinson. You know, you draft some guys. You can probably get away with it. Look, they, you definitely can get away. Look, this year they figured out a way to get through a season with Isaiah Hodgins and Richie James at wide receiver, but they didn't figure out a way to get through a season with Jalen Smith and Jared Davis at linebacker. They never figured out a way. At some point, look, they they created a passing game toward the end of the season. Yeah, matchup based in some examples, but they had passing yards and they had explosive plays at the end of the season. They at no point stopped power gap running. They at no point fixed their run defense because of these linebackers. So I am looking at two players to start. T, uh, TJ Edwards, former Badger, but that's not the reason why. Uh, Eagles inside backer who played an amazing season. I watch him play and I think he's just like a the perfect guy to sign. I don't think he's going to require a big contract and I think he's going to get the job done and he's going to be a really stabilizing piece for that inside linebacker group. That's why he's probably my top target. I, I would say David long is a better player and I'd rather have David long, another inside linebacker, but David long to me has some guys in the media talking about him and I hear some really good buzz some film guys. He's the type of guy who I think can get like a bigger contract than people think or expect. And then you'll be like, Oh, yep. Yeah. David long. He, he's earning it. But TJ Edwards is not in that, breath and you can think about Tremaine Edmonds but I think Edmonds is going to price himself out of the Giants range because as Nick discussed I think he's right first the Giants have to worry about resigning their own and it's not just Jones and Barkley it's the coming contracts for Dexter Lawrence and Andrew Thomas that have to be weighing heavily on Joe Shane's plan he knows he's going to eventually have to give a lot of cap space to those two players so I'm looking basically at free agency like similar to last year with the Glowinski signing and then a few minor ones but to me that Glowinski deal is going to be an inside backer deal other names just to monitor other than Tremaine Edmonds and David Long and TJ Edwards would be Bobby O'Karake, I think is somebody to yeah. kind of recognize. He's a player from the Indianapolis Colts. He is a Stanford guy, reportedly very smart. I think he's uh, everything I've seen of him. And even when we watched the Colts on film this year, I was like, okay, that guy's a pretty damn good linebacker. And we discussed it on the film review if anybody wants to go back and watch. So that's one other name. I don't know his price point right now, but I'll more than likely be doing a profile on him uh, for Big Blue View if anybody wants to check that out. Yeah, and then it's outside of that, we'll, we'll we'll look more at specific players as we get closer. But positions wise, I think you can typically. It's very unlikely. It's more much more rare to find good corners in free agency, in my opinion, unless you're paying like top dollar for the top guy. That get that the Jets did it last year with DJ Reed, but that's so rare. Like you see, so few teams hit. Most of these cornerback free agent signings are dead money. So I would actually wait at corner and go through the draft in that situation, or try to find like back end guys in free agency, like Fabian Moreau types. I feel very similarly to. Um, uh, basically the wide receiver position, I think. I don't think the Giants can do much there in free agency. There's not many good free agents. The only one that would be of interest to me, Nick, is if Odo Beckham Jr. is interested in the Giants and he's not taking like some massive deal. I'd be willing to, 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 to potentially put some cap space into a shorter-term deal with Odell Beckham, like a two- or three-year deal, depending on where they're at with that. But, you know, I think as you, excuse me, as you look through this free agency, <laughs> sorry about that, there's going to be, Plenty of players that we look at now that ultimately don't end up hitting free agency. So we have to keep that in mind. Absolutely. Now we got a question from our friend Rob Allen asks, Big Blue Lanter, so I don't look at things for face value typically. Overall, Giants offense was very middle of the pack, but Kafka is getting a lot of attention for head coach jobs. How much of this is that he took a bad quarterback and he made him look good. And I would also throw in the fact that Daniel Jones was well into his career and he was able to turn that around. Yeah, I think that that's a great point, Rob. Look, if you're an owner of an NFL team, right, and you're trying to find the next coach that could bring your franchise, to, you know, out of the depths of where it, where it somehow fell to, what's the best way to do it? You think the best way to do it is to fix a quarterback that you have already or draft a new quarterback and have someone who can immediately get him up to speed in the NFL or bring out the best in him. So the best way to do that is by finding some of these coaches who have done that. And that's exactly what Kafka played a part in doing. It's not just Kafka. It's Tierney. It's Dable as well. But all three of them played a big role in 
turning a quarterback around, Daniel Jones, who had three years that weren't really good, even the first year, if you look at the advanced stats, he was not nearly the player. Like this year, Daniel Jones was like, you know, top, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think he was like top 12 in, in things like uh, EPA, completion percentage over expected, all those numbers, even dating back to his so-called good rookie year, were all like bottom five. And now they finally reached like the top 12, top 15 range. So he did that with the quarterback. He helped fix a lot of his flaws. And at the same time, you can look at it specifically like, damn, this dude figured out a way to really turn a red zone offense around that was dead in the water for two straight years under Jason Garrett. And if you look at some of the designs, some of his red zone designs, and some not even just red zone, like 25-yard line, 30-yard line in, he had some really creative plays and creative ways to get players open and to create touchdowns and big plays in the red zone so all of that combined makes him a really good candidate i think to be that guy and that's why he's getting so much attention from so multiple teams this offseason that needs a young offensive mind and the entire league is still trying to find the next sean mcveigh the next kyle shanahan and they're wondering if mike kafka is that guy i'll also say on top of that i think the primary reason is the daniel jones factor yeah. but this is also a coordinator who did an excellent job scheming against different defenses he doesn't necessarily have a system that is rigid he has a very fluid operation where he can change up his approach depending on how the defense is playing him and i think that is another really desirable attribute in a head coach that's a great point too. think about all the games we watched this year where the Giants added new wrinkles to their run game or where the game plan from one week was totally different to the next one. It also makes you wonder against the Eagles when the Giants couldn't get any offense going and they kind of were relying on something they had been using for a few weeks. What was the main reason why they were unable to, to adjust and do anything? And that's the bigger question for another day uh, as far as, you know, how do you fix that? But anyway, Dills Houlihan, is that his name? Dills, Dills Houlihan asks what a, what a name where what what are a couple currently off the radar moves you could envision joe shane making this offseason would be you could uh mention a surprising cut a surprising trade a signing also connecticut pizza is the best hashtag pepe's reigns supreme i'll have a comment on that but go ahead nick i don't know if this is off the beaten path or anything but kenny galladay is not going to be a giant next year that's pretty well anticipated though i feel like right the giants are gonna yeah. eat that dead cap do you know the dead cap off the top of your head dan it depends if they make it a post june one cut or a pre-june one cut it's oh. more dead cap next year if they make it a, a post june one cut but they'll have more cap space this year and it's less cap space next year because there won't be any dead cap or they'll have more cap space next year there won't be any dead cap if they make it a pre-june one i think knowing shane He's going to make it a pre-June one because he doesn't want to have more dead cap carried over to next year with Galladay. If it was Gettleman, it would be the total opposite of that because Gettleman operated in the other way. I actually think I lean the Gettleman way on this specific example because I just don't think – they're not going to have much dead cap anyway next year, so they're, I'm fine taking on a little bit of Kenny Galladay and having a little bit more space this year to work with. But it really just depends on if they want to get aggressive or not in free agency. The Kenny Galladay move, which again isn't really a big surprise, and yeah. then Leonard Williams. I don't envision Joe Shane going into this season with Leonard Williams making 32 freaking million dollars, which is an insane amount of money. Leonard Williams is the highest play, paid defensive player in the league. He is the third highest paid non quarterback. So I think that number is going to be adjusted, whether that be via pay cut or I don't know how the Giants feel about Leonard Williams right now. Some sort of extension that will lower this cap hit. I can maybe envision that happening, but I think both of those things will happen. And then you have the big question marks around Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley, which I think Daniel Jones will be back. Saquon Barkley, I, I think he'll ultimately be back, but I think it's maybe a little bit less certain than at least how I feel about Daniel Jones. But I don't really think any of those that I listed are gigantic surprises. Yeah, I'm trying to think as you went through those, I'm trying to think of if I can think of any potential surprise. It's weird because the Giants don't really have a roster right now where I think there could be any surprise cuts because you mentioned even like a Leonard Williams type. There's so much dead cap still tied to that contract thanks to guaranteed money kind of tied to that thanks to Dave Gettleman and the weird structure he had with that deal that it's like you can't even really cut him right now without taking on like a, ba a bad dead cap hit. And do you want to either? Like he's still an yeah. important player right now. You have no depth. On especially the after line, you made it. Yeah, especially, you know, they made the decision already. They made their bed. They traded BJ Hill for what turned out to be nothing. That obviously with a little with a little more foresight, they could have kept the third round pick, 
not traded for Leonard Williams when they weren't winning games anyway, re-signed B.J. Hill for a third of the price of Leonard Williams, and we'd be in a much better spot. We'd have $20 million in cap space. B.J. Hill's not that much of a worse of a player than Leonard Williams was last year. He is overall, if they're both healthy, but not $20 million worse. Nowhere close. And plus a third-round pick. You never know what could happen with that. But, of course, this is the reason why Nick and I were saying that was a bad trade at the time. Others disagree. Some have said since that it's been proven to be a good trade i don't really know how as we as we enter the situation where he's the third highest paid non-quarterback next year but it is what it is and now they can't get out of that one and that's fine it is what it is but as far as surprise moves go one might be you would think okay so like a dory jackson could be a surprise move maybe right nick but no because they had to kick cap back because of the situation they were in and they got they put themselves in a situation where they can't really cut him either and they can't afford to cut him anyway because they don't have corners on their roster so it's not really a roster where you can see surprise cuts coming from. Trades are so hard to predict, in my opinion. I would think the biggest surprise, though, would be... I'll, I'll, actually, I have something here. Surprise. He's asking for surprises. Okay. Surprise to me would be if Joe Shane says, I don't care about what John Mara says. I don't care about what the fan base says. I'm not paying Saquon Barkley. Or, uh, I'm not paying a second running back contract out to a player with a, with a big injury history. And he lets Saquon Barkley walk. Or... He surprises me even more by franchise tagging Barkley and then trading some and getting some draft capital for him. Even if it's like a fourth round pick or a third round pick or something like that, that would surprise me. Both would surprise me. I don't think they're going to uh, not re-sign Daniel Jones. And I think they should re-sign Daniel Jones. So I'm not going to put that as a surprising move. Cause that's just, I just don't think it's happening, but the Barkley one would surprise me. Cause I'm, I'm convinced they're going to re-sign Barkley and pay him probably 14, 15 million a year. But if they don't, and if they somehow get him, if they somehow can find a way to tag and trade him, that's a that's a pleasant surprise for me. So that'll be my surprise. I think that's and, a really good surprise because it's one that yeah. you can like you don't think or expect that to happen. But if it were to happen, you'd be like, I can see it. It's a little yeah. bold, but I can see it. It's bold. It's definitely bold, especially with this fan base. Uh, it's a bold move. As far as the pizza debate goes. Uh, first of all, I completely agree with you. I've come around completely. Connecticut pizza, New Haven pizza is the best pizza in the world. And I say that as a strong believer in New York, New Jersey pizza being the most consistent. So here's the deal. It's the best in the world, Connecticut, on a pure bite by bite basis. But I still believe New York and New Jersey is the best place for pizza in the world because that's just New Haven. If you go to other places in Connecticut, you're probably the average pizza in Connecticut. Here's the reason why I love New Jersey, New York, New Jersey. The average pizza in New York, New Jersey, average pizzeria is better than anywhere in the world by such a far margin. So if you go to random places in Connecticut, you're not going to get that New Haven style probably, and you're not going to get as good pizza. So overall, I still believe in New York, New Jersey, but on a per bite basis and just the top of the top tier, New Haven is the best. And I've now had Sally's and Pepe's. I actually like Sally's more than Pepe's and Pepe's is great too. They're both phenomenal pizza. Pepe's had the better sauce, but overall I found Sally's just to be the better pizza. Um, I don't know what it was, but it was just a better slice to me. Um, and soon I'll have modern and a few of these other ones, but next time I go up there, but yeah. All right. Akuna Matata asks, if you're Joe Shane trying to work out the contract for Daniel Jones, would you try to include heavy incentive based money into the deal? in case 2022 was just a blip on the radar for Daniel Jones. Absolutely. If you're going to pay Daniel Jones, you have to have some sort of incentive-based contract, and you also have to give the team some sort of out after maybe year two, year one, what have you. I'm not sure how long the contract's going to be constructed, just in case Daniel Jones doesn't take the progression that Brian Dable and Joe Shane hope that he will take. He's still a young player, and there are still aspects of Daniel Jones's game that can improve. But if they don't improve, you don't want to be tied down long term to a huge contract with quarterback position like the Philadelphia Eagles were with Carson Wentz or Jared Goff with the Los Angeles Rams. You don't want to be in that situation. So I absolutely agree. You need incentives, and I think you should have a void year or or some sort of way yes. that you can get out of the deal. I completely agree with you. And I think it's more than fair to give for both sides to accept that, right? Like everything, here's the deal with Daniel Jones. He had an amazing year this year. He really did in a lot of ways. We, we just touched on some of it earlier, this podcast and, and overall, but it's not fair that some people are just completely disregarding the first three years of his career because of the coaching, because of the situation, because that doesn't tell the whole story. He wasn't a very good quarterback in a lot of ways. He had horrible pocket presence, horrible pocket feel. He got injured a lot. He even, you know, 
three years in a row of injuries. And so we have to, in Joe Shane's case, I think it's fair. And in our case, I think it's fair to consider every factor here and the full sample size of the four years, not just the last year in developing and creating the contract that Daniel Jones will ultimately sign with the Giants. And that's a big reason why I want what Nick said, the, the, the out in the contract, like a Derek Carr thing. But if not, what I want and the main thing I want out of this Daniel Jones deal, I don't really, everyone's talking about the numbers. And I actually don't really care that much if it's going to be 32 or 36 or 37. To me, that's not as important as make sure it's a three-year deal. Make sure you're not doing five to seven year. Make sure you're not putting a ton of guaranteed money into this contract. Because quite frankly, you need to have the ability to get out of this if what you said uh, in Hakuna Matata is true. And this was one, he's had one good year out of four. And if that ends up being the case, rather than he's developing and becoming better and better, they need to have an ability to not have this contract tied down to the point where they're at the golf situation that the Rams were at two years ago, where they literally have to trade draft picks away just to get golf off the roster. Exactly. We don't want to find ourselves in that situation. So you have to, and I, I think Joe Shane and Kevin Abrams will be, you have to be prudent with how you construct this contract. There's, there's nothing that suggests that Joe Shane is going to give some sort of wild contract that's going to really hinder the Giants maneuverability later. If Daniel Jones does not develop, I, I don't necessarily think that it could be a huge number, like you said, but I think if you look at the fine details, there will be right. stuff in that contract that will allow the Giants to get out of it. If it all goes south, Ladle yep. Stein asks, the riddle wrapped inside a gigantic jersey poised underneath a beard. John Feliciano, is he good? Gets out there in space. Got a Pro Bowl alternative berth. Didn't he actually protect pretty well? What's up? <laughs> so he's asking about John Feliciano. Yeah, that's a good question. I think I'm curious to get your take on this, Nick. At the center position, I think it's one of the easier positions to kind of hide behind if that makes any kind of sense on the it's the easiest position i should say on the offense line of all five positions i think it's the one that easy it's, we've seen a lot of centers come through the giants you know we've seen nick gates we've seen obviously now john feliciano players in the past i mean there's been some bad ones too david boss i don't forget david boss who was the worst center i've ever watched play football for the new york giants and i think he was signed to like a decent sized contract that was a horrific deal but for the most part i feel like you can see a lot of average play out of centers and the difference makers like the, the the Creed Humphreys, the Jason Kelsey's, those are kind of the guys to me that get out in space and make those second level blocks. Um, so I think you can kind of see with players like Feliciano, yeah, they will kind of hold up pretty well in pass protection. They kind of always and Nick Gates kind of held up pretty well in pass protection. As far as getting out there in space, there are a few there are some good reps of Feliciano, but I didn't really find him to be a player who did a really good job of getting out in space and making second level blocks that changed games or or, may, or or created some of our explosive plays. To me, John Feliciano is an average center, nothing more, nothing less. I kind of feel like Nick Gates was a similar player when he was playing with the Giants. He got a lot of hype, but for the most part, and I think, and I thought Nick Gates was a better player than Feliciano because I thought he did a better job of helping, helping other blockers and helping the, the two guys in between him, the guards on either side. But overall, I feel like they're both kind of just average players at the position. I'm right there. I'm right there with you. I think they're both average players. If John Feliciano is a starter next year, I would hope the Giants would invest in like a Cam Jurgens, like the Philadelphia Eagles did last year, someone who they can groom. And then eventually later on in the season, that guy can take over the center position. That's my ideal hope. I think, and I know a lot of people on Giants Twitter agree with this, Dan, the Giants need to find a true center. They got to stop recycling guards into yeah. this position, right? Just find a true center that you can build around. Like Creed Humphrey was that perfect guy, and now he's headed to the Super Bowl with the Kansas City Chiefs. That's excellent. Those guys don't always grow on trees, but there will be true centers in this draft, and I hope the Giants will look to really just finally find an answer at that position because that has been something that's evaded them for the last decade. And I'll say this on this note, Nick, because it's something I've seen pop up a couple times on Giants Twitter. Both of these players who are free agents, Nick Gates and Feliciano, are much bigger priorities to re-sign for me than a lot of these other players. I'll even, to be quite frank, I'll put Julian Love in that mix because I think the possible, like, if you don't re-sign either of them, right? If your option is we don't re-sign Gates, we don't re-sign Feliciano, you're now leaving an interior offensive line going into free agency in the draft with just Mark Lewinsky, Josh Azudu, and, and uh, Ben Bredesen. For three starting positions right there. Now you have no depth. You're hoping to find depth out of rookies or free agents who are not it's hard to find a free agent that can give you. Look, the Giants had to give a pretty sizable contract to Mark Lewinsky, and he's not that good of a player. Imagine if you're using even less money or you're, you're going even more bargain based in signing for these interior offensive linemen. You have a chance to find just total busts like the Giants have done in the past with some of these guys they brought in. I think from a depth standpoint, 
and from the fact that both these guys have started at the center position and Nick Gates actually has played multiple positions for the Giants. Those are like big priority resignings for me. I'm big on continuing to just have depth on this offensive line and never putting themselves in a position like they had going into 2021 season where they're scrambling, panic trading for guys like, you know, Billy Price and giving away assets like DJ Hill, signing all these guys who are like retiring in camp. Like you never want to put yourself in that position again. That's why I look at them. People are like, should they even resign these two guys? They're not that good. I'm like, yeah, they kind of, for me, it's like they kind of have to. So they don't put themselves in that position ever again. I'm right there with you, Dan, and I think they will look to resign both of them. I don't know if either of them will be guaranteed or they shouldn't be guaranteed and they won't be guaranteed starting positions, but I think both of them will garner just light contracts relative to other players who will be on yes. free agency. So I don't see any harm in bringing them back. They know Bobby Johnson. I feel like they were both solid. They were average, right? So I'm open to bringing them both back, but I'm not opening to or open to guaranteeing either of them a starting position. I do hope the Giants invest in the offensive line, interior offensive line specifically, through the draft. Yeah, I have to completely agree with you on that. Both back as depth guys who you can start if you need to, but at the same time, don't just let them go. Okay, Shimmy God asks, Shimmy God, I'll say it. It's a G-A-W-D, God. That's the the uh, you know the Brooklyn Jewish way of saying, sh saying Shimmy God. He says, the way Giants fans react to any criticism of Daniel Jones how much fear for your lives would you have if we had a QB on the level of Mahomes, Burrow, and Herbert? I think if we had a quarterback on that level, we would all be in agreement a lot of the time. <laughs> like yeah. we, would, we would all just be like, look, this guy, look, he missed one throw once. Oh, geez. It would just be a, a very happy place because we would be consistently competing for right. Super Bowls. So maybe that would bring the... I don't know, the, the the nature of Giants Twitter, which seems to be pugnacious in the sense that everyone's looking to quarrel and fight all of the damn time. Maybe that would bring that down just a little bit and we could calm down a little bit because we have that true long-term answer in place. Because for me, Daniel Jones, it's still not guaranteed that he is the true long-term answer, albeit I am open to bringing him back next season. Yeah, it's interesting. Like with the, you know, I, I understand where he's coming from here. It's like, thinking look look at how they can't even handle any ounce of criticism for jones and a lot of fans on giant twitter just can't simply handle even an ounce of criticism i remember a, a few weeks ago uh, brett coleman broke down something that we've broken down on our podcast how like jones will see that cover too and he'll throw that quick out when he's when every good quarterback is seeing that he knows you have to throw vertical there everyone's like freaking out on the guy and it's like dude he just broke down like a simple thing like this is not that big of a deal we can handle occasional criticism of a quarterback especially if your quarterback's not Mahomes Burrow or like what are we talking about here like we have to be able to discern the difference between these quarterbacks like Mahomes and Jones they're if we can't, if we can think the only difference is that one guy doesn't have receivers and one guy doesn't have an O line and the other guy does, that's not that's not helpful. That's not really healthy. It's not a good way to look at this thing. Um, but I think I agree with Nick. It would be a much easier to evaluate or not evaluate, but to stay level headed with a quarterback like Mahomes and Burrow because most of what you're seeing is is good and you're going to Super Bowls a lot and you're competing a lot. So I don't think it would be the same. I think a better question would be like a, a quarterback like Dak Prescott. That would be interesting if the Giants had Dak right now. Um, and, that, and that's kind of like where I would kind of lean toward that. Um, Johnny Rudin asks, what was each of your favorite moments from this past season? That's a good question. I think, yeah, I think winning the wild card round might be the best moment. Defeating Minnesota. Really just from Minnesota to Minnesota were like my favorite moments of the season. But I'll also say going for two in week one, was was a high point but i didn't even necessarily expect at that point that the giants would go off and and be the team that they were right. we expected that they could have an outside shot at the playoffs you had them winning nine games i had them winning eight games and they exceeded my expectation because i feel like the coaching was so much more superior than i even anticipated even though i knew the coaching was going to be superior than what we saw last year with jason garrett and joe judge so if i had to pick any i'm gonna pick two it's the go for two and then it's the end of the season when the Giants beat Minnesota before the downfall in Philadelphia. Yeah, I would go. Uh, I'll narrow it down to two then as well. My two favorites would be I'll go from two to one. My second favorite would be when the Giants beat the Ravens this season. I hmm. think going into that game, I still felt like the Ravens were the old Ravens. They still had Lamar Jackson. He was fully healthy. I felt like this was one of the best teams in the NFL at that time. The Giants found a way to beat them. So what was, what was you just show there? It just has promoted to uncle. I mean, it's so about two years old now, not two, okay. but 
once I realized yeah. it, it was like two. <laughs> I didn't know why you showed it though. I thought there was like a reason, like some kind of inside. Yeah, I was showing the YouTube audience. I'm not showing you. Continue <laughs> okay. with your point. <laughs> okay. uh, at the time, I felt like the Ravens were still one of the best teams in the NFL and the Giants beat them. So that was like a, whoa, wake up moment. Like, oh my God, this team actually can make some noise this year. So that was a good one for me. But the number one is definitely the wild card win over the Minnesota Vikings. Watching with my brother was a really fun experience. We were watching. Look, it's not just that they won that wild card game. It's that they won that game with such a consistent performance from the offense and from the passing game. That was like, when you start to see that, you start to get really, really excited because to me in the end, as we see from this Super Bowl, guess what? Guess what these two teams have in common, the Eagles and the Chiefs. They're number one and number two in explosive pass plays this season. Think about that. And that's been a trend that we've seen now over the last several seasons. Number one and number two in explosive pass plays. In that game, the Giants were actually creating some explosive pass plays against the Vikings. So it felt very good. Tacoma Roy asks, or Roe asks, with what Lou Anarumo is doing with the Bengals, he adds to the illustrious history of accomplished coaches who were once Giants assistants, Lombardi, Landry, Belichick, and Peyton. How would you rank the best Giants assistant coaches of all time in terms of overall success? I think that is an excellent question. And I'm imagining it's overall success once they left the New York Giants is what he's probably driving at. Another phenomenal question here. Um, this one's going to show my ageism because I don't really remember much from Lombardi or Landry. So I'm going to go <laughs> Belichick one. Obviously, that's the clear cut one. Peyton two. And I, and I, I know I know enough about them. All right, Lombard, Belichick, Lombardi, Payton, Landry, because those are obviously the clear-cut four. Um, and then you start to get into some of the, the lesser guys. I mean, even like someone like, look, Steve Spagnuolo is finding a lot of success in his post-Giants career. I know he didn't do it as a head coach, but he's now had a long-tenured career as the Chiefs defensive coordinator. Uh, Lou Anarumo is probably going to get a head coaching job pretty soon, and that's from a defensive coordinator spot, which is harder to get these days in the NFL, so he'd be up there. I'd have to really think more about some of the other ones we've lost over the years that have really stung, but Belichick and Payton for me in my lifetime are the ones that really stand out. Yeah. I'm going to go Belichick, Lombardi, Landry, and that's a solidified top three. I would probably go Sean Payton, but you also have coaches, assistant coaches like John Fox, who had a successful right. tenure with New York Giants. Uh, I believe his name was Ron Earhart, the offensive coordinator for oh, 86 yeah. and 90. I mean, there's, I know he was a pretty innovative offensive mind back in his day, as before our time, but I know he was a, a really um, highly regarded assistant coach for the New York Giants. So th there are a lot of guys kind of dating back to that time that I'm not overly familiar with, and I just kind of yeah. know through reading books on the New York Giants. But I think the top three have to be Belichick, Lombardi, and Landry. And I'm wondering, Dan, if anybody would contend having Belichick over Lombardi because of everything Lombardi has done from just being the excellent offensive mind that he was to to really everything he did as a head football coach for the Green Bay Packers. And then with Bill Belichick and just how much success he's had with the dynasty of the Patriots. I'm wondering if people, because Lombardi is the goat of goats, if people would be like, nah, it's definitely Lombardi over Belichick. Yeah, it's like the whole, it's another Peyton Brady debate all over again. But yeah, it's crazy. The Giants have had all these assistants who have gone on to have such successful careers head coaching elsewhere. Just, just weird. I mean, bad circumstance in a lot of spots. They had to let these guys out of the building. Though I would say the Sean Payton one is the one that will always sting the most to me. So I, I, I love Jim Fossil for who he was. But at the same time, I, I kind of always knew that. You know, Sean Payton was one of the biggest reasons the Giants made to that 2000 Super Bowl. He took a team that did not have that much talent on the offensive side of the ball, in my opinion, re re rehashed a career of a quarterback who was dead in the water in Kerry Collins. I mean, they got him in free agency, the Giants. No one really put up too much of a fight to sign him and created an offense out of that just by purely great scheme and great coaching. So I always kind of knew that they were letting a really good one go with Belichick. It was, it was a little different because it's like, what are you going to do? You have Parcells. It's, it's not easy. And he was bound to get a head coaching job, but this John Payton one stings me a little more. Okay. Gang sign. John asks, let's say hypothetically D Daniel Jones leaves for whatever reason. What is the more appealing of two options for you guys? One trading major assets away for Lamar plus, a, well, Lamar's a free agent. So, I would say let's change that to signing Lamar for a big deal plus a Watson like contract. So yeah, just signing Lamar for a big deal or excuse me, starting Tyrod Taylor, hoping he bottoms out and then you end up with Caleb Williams or Drake may. I personally can't decide. That's interesting. I think I'm on the starting Tyrod Taylor train and I don't know how much I feel about that. 
I like Lamar Jackson a lot. And I think Lamar Jackson is a very talented quarterback who does has now last two years has had some injury issues. I think Lamar Jackson in this offense would be very exciting, but if he actually wants the contract that Deshaun Watson got, which it seems like he does, I don't know if I'm fully comfortable giving something like that out. And I don't know if I'm off there, but that's where I am initially leaning. I, I think I would go with bottoming out and then going into what 2020 um four with a rookie contract of caleb williams going forward who is just an unreal prospect coming out of usc or drake may out of unc yeah this is an interesting hypothetical scenario because it's really narrowed down i would also lean toward where nick is leaning i'll start with the lamar piece injuries have started to concern me a lot with lamar that's one thing i do think that look this coaching staff dable kafka tyranny can get a crap ton out of Lamar Jackson and design an offense that would be really fun and really successful with a player like Lamar Jackson. But I do still worry about concerns of, you know, everyone says once you get to the NFL playoffs, you have to really have those quarterbacks who can throw outside the numbers and can stretch all areas of the field. And that's something that, as you'll see, defenses start to really clamp down on the middle of the field and take that away from you. And now what do you do to adjust? And Lamar didn't do a great job of it with his, with his first couple of playoff go arounds. Um, I don't think he throws the best ball to the outs. Personally, I think he's much better over the top deep ball and then kind of on those in breakers, which you can still create a good offense over. Look, the Giants created an offense this year that really didn't throw outside the numbers much at all. So it's possible. But when you give that kind of huge contract to him, like Nick is talking about as the Deshaun Watson money, it gets a lot harder to put the pieces around him like a Saquon Barkley or some of these other, you know, offensive linemen that you would need to kind of create the best offense. So I would choose the second one. But I will say this about the second one. I don't necessarily personally agree with the premise here. If if Daniel Jones left, I personally think that Brian Dable, and I'll go to my grave with this. I don't care because I don't, anyone who disagrees with this or calls me crazy because of this really has zero proof or evidence to suggest their, their point of view. And I don't have proof either. That's why I'm speculating. But the speculation for me is if Tyrod played, I don't think this offense, I don't think this team would completely bottom out with Tyrod Taylor. It's my personal opinion. I think these coaches are that good that they can create an offense that Tyrod Taylor would run. Now, Tyrod Taylor would turn the football over a lot more than Daniel Jones did this year. So Giants would literally lose games because of that. But I still think they'd win like six or seven games, maybe seven or eight games type of thing. Maybe not next year's schedule though, man. Oh, the schedule is really hard. So that's a good point. So maybe they end up losing. I think they'd lose another two or three games with Tyrod Taylor for sure, just based on the turnovers. So maybe if the schedule's tough, you have a chance to bottom out and get a Caleb Williams or Drake May type. But yeah, Nick and I are always going to be in the in the in the boat of we want the quarterback on the rookie rookie contract because that's when you can really win in the NFL. And I love Caleb Williams and Drake May, especially Williams. But we'll see. Adam Hepburn asks: The Giants have nine picks and projected for two more comp picks, like we went over before, for Lorenzo Carter and Keon Crossan. That's a total of eleven. Do you favor holding them to maximize the dart throws? or look to deal picks for players? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Uh, obviously, the past GM, Dave Gettleman, was big on like packaging a bunch of picks to move up for players. We've seen other teams do it successfully and unsuccessfully in the past. Joe Shane was not of that ilk. He did it a different way, despite having a lot of picks. And I am in favor of that way. If it's just one or the two, what would I prefer? I, I am in favor of holding them to maximize dart throws. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean I would never trade some of those picks to trade up. There's And, and that kind of goes into the bias of the whole draft thing, right? It's like I, me and Nick could find players that we think are insane values, just 12 picks before the Giants are on the clock. And we say, oh, let's trade some picks to get those guys. But that still goes into the whole bias of the draft process, right? Like we don't know better than the draft. And that's the key thing here. I don't know if any of these GMs know better than the rest of the GMs. And so with that mindset in mind, and if you hold true to that process, you really should hold all the picks and try to maximize your dart throws. And there's also a draft board, right? So not everybody who is going to be drafted is going to be on the Giants draft board. And I honestly don't know how many players are on Joe Shane's draft board, but I do know that Joe Shane seems to be really meticulous with how he grades his players in the sense that they have to be smart, tough, dependable. It doesn't mean he's not going to make exceptions, but I do think they want a specific type of person in their locker room. I think that is important to the New York Giants. So that's going to rule out some very talented players that Dan and I might like on film, but we're not in the interview room with them. So we have no idea how they are as people. So that's another important thing to, to kind of go over. I mean, they used to discuss like NFL media, how Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots would have just like not even that many people on their draft, like 60 people on their draft yep. board. 
going into a draft. So some of these draft boards are are really short because these teams want specific body types, specific personalities, and specific players. Yep. Joe Joel Pillar asks, has watching that Eagles game or after watching that Eagles game, how willing are you guys to trade mid round assets for established interior offensive linemen, knowing the tendency of rookie offensive linemen to struggle? I mean, I didn't really my mind didn't go there, Joel, to be honest. I didn't just say, hey, let's go and acquire interior offensive linemen who are a little bit more established because those guys are going to have hefty contracts more than likely. Teams aren't going to be trading guys on their rookie deals. So that's not necessarily where I'm at. I'm hoping that the Giants sign some depth guys, maybe in free agency or draft guys in free agency to create competition. And then Josh Azudu and Ben Bredesen continue to take a step forward as young players who can really round out this interior offensive line. But I'm not necessarily down with trading like a third round pick for an interior offensive lineman. And I don't think there are a lot of interior offensive linemen worth a damn that are available for their for third round picks. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. Joel, look, I think you're onto something with the idea of let's not just rinse and replace and get rid of some of these guys that played this year on the offensive line for the giant giants in the hope of just like finding them in the draft. Because then, like you said, rookie offensive linemen do tend to struggle. We've seen it over the years, but at the same time, on the flip side of that, think back over the last five years of following the NFL. Have you really seen any of these trades you're proposing? You get somebody gives a second or third or fourth round pick and they get some kind of established offensive lineman that never happens because let's be honest about the situation across the NFL. There really aren't that many good established offensive linemen. And if teams have them, they don't want to get rid of them. AKA Kevin Zeitler, no clue why Dave Gettleman got rid of him, but he did. And so when you have these established guys, you tend to keep them. So I think the better, the better route would be, for the Giants to continue to bring back guys like Nick Gates and, and um, John Feliciano on team-friendly deals. Josh Zudu comes back. Ben Bredesen comes back. Evan Neal comes back. And then continue to add. So you don't have to rely on these rookies, but you also have potential rookies to supplant guys that are already playing for you. Right there with you. CEO Baseball Dad asks, what do you think is the next Big innovation in the NFL coming, and what can the Giants do to be at the forefront of it? I really like this question. That is a good question. That's a tough question, though, CO Baseball Dad. Uh, and I hope that's Colorado Baseball Dad, my favorite state uh, in the union. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of a next, like, the next innovation. So, like, pre-snap motion has been one of the recent big innovations in the NFL, right? We can think about it like that. That's a big one. What's the next one coming? Nick, do you have a better, do you have something that comes to mind quick? That we can, we can I think it's going to be something to, to counter quarters and palms and cover four type of defenses. So right. something to counter the split safety looks that we've been seeing. And I think we saw that earlier in this year when teams are running the ball efficiently on early downs and even on later downs because so many teams were aligning in the Vic Fangio going to have split safeties, two safeties, like, you know, 10 yards off the ball. So teams countered it by running the football, which theoretically bring uh, uh, defenders down towards the box to help stop the run to kind of keep those defenses honest. I think it's always just a, a chess match and a cat and mouse game between offense and defense because we see the offense now using a lot more RPOs and a lot more motion, a lot more stacked alignments, bunches, things like that, ways to kind of create pre-snap eye candy or just after the snap, post-snap eye candy to draw second-level defenders one direction just to give running backs or whomever slight leverage towards the outside if it's an outside run or what have you. So I, I think it's going to be, just from a broad sense, ways for the offense to take advantage of those split safety cover four looks that are proliferating all around the NFL. And as for the defense, it's going to be to still prevent those explosive plays via cover four quarters type of looks but also have elements of players that can still defend the run, which we saw with the Los Angeles Rams back in what was that 2020 when yeah. Brendan Staley was the defensive coordinator. He did an excellent job there. He hasn't necessarily had that type of success with the Los Angeles Chargers sure. yet because he doesn't have that same personnel. He doesn't have Jalen Ramsey. He doesn't have Aaron Donald, but you need the, you need the right personnel to, I think, execute that. But I, I think, a lot of defenses around the league are really attempting to replicate what Vic Fangio has set down. Just like we saw before this, it was what cover three for, from the yep. Gus Bradley, the, the Pete Carroll, all that. It was all the Seattle cover three Legion of boom type stuff. And then the next iteration now is more cover four because you have freaks of nature like Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes and, and all these guys who can bomb the ball 70 yards down the football field and create explosive plays. So defenses are trying to take away the explosive plays. And I think offenses are keeping them a little bit honest just by running the football and then keeping things really tight. A lot of quick hitting passes, RPOs, things of that nature. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great breakdown of that. And I wonder how much of it is like 
to beat those kinds of defenses. You simply just need the quarterbacks who can throw those whole shots, right? I mean, you could do a lot of different things in the run game. You could win with the double teams up front inside, or you could run like power, power gap concept, pin pull type stuff and try to win with those. But how often, like at some point the defense is just going to be like, all right, we'll give you those. I mean, how often are you breaking explosive plays off with those? We'll let you matriculate down the field and then settle for a field goal. But the quarterbacks who can just rip those whole shots against those coverages, those ones are going to be, you know, that's how you beat them. But like, how do you find those quarterbacks? We have such a bad quarterbacks shortage around the NFL. So I wonder if maybe we'll see it's so, it's so interesting to me because it's tough to see the development of quarterback making a big jump for me nick because the college game is so different than the nfl game and i really think that the, the whole sport would be all better off if they change the college game to fit the pro game and they stop letting the colleges line up on one one hash or another to have that full you know field side that you wouldn't like it just it changes the whole way football is played it changes the whole way defenses play them in college football you look at some of the big 12 stuff and it really in my opinion impacts the development of quarterback it's why we have one of the reasons we have the quarterback shortage it's not the only reason it's one of the reasons so I'm curious how, you know, how teams will look to attack those styles of defenses. But as far as other innovations that might be the next big one coming, I don't know if I have any right now, CO data. I'll have to come back to you with this one. We have Anthony asks, what was the craziest round you've ever had in poker? This is not for me because I've never played poker. So Dan, go ahead. <laughs> oh, this is a good one, Anthony. I'm trying to think if I should use numbers on this podcast. I don't think it's going to put me in any kind of trouble. So craziest session of online poker i've ever had there are two ones that come to mind the first one would be really young in my poker career i was in my early 20s i was hammered drunk in atlantic city at the end of the night i decided to go play poker i don't know why it was like 2 a.m everyone was was going to sleep decided to play anyway completely hammered out of my mind drunk and i sit down at a table and somehow find a way to get into a and my one friend chris Chris Cody, shout out, will never let me down, live this one down. But I somehow found a way to get into a massive argument with a Cowboys fan about Jason Witten to the point where we were heated. We were getting in each other's face and the security had to like calm us down or they were going to kick us out over Jason freaking Witten. I don't know how it happened. I don't know any of the details, but that was one of my craziest ones. As far as actual poker goes, I would say my craziest session ever was an online session I had. Um, it was actually recently about a month ago. Uh, five card PLO, which Nick refers to as PLO, but PLO, it's maybe, yeah, five card PLO. Um, I went down $3,500 and found a way to end up positive on the day with a massive comeback, the greatest comeback in my poker history life. I thought I was going to be, you know, on the curb, handing out ZJs to make money and to pay my rent for that month. But instead I was able to rally back and put in and get myself into the positive. And if you don't know what a ZJ is, you can't afford one as, as they said, what was that movie? Beer fest. Was that beer fest? Maybe. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's DJ. No, no, no. It's a, it's a, it's a joke. I think from beer fest where the guy was like under, under a bridge, like the homeless. And he's like, man, I was handing out ZJs. He's like, what's a ZJ. If you don't know, you can't afford one. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Man. Yeah. So I made it back and it was a crazy session, man. Just going from being stuck so much to, to somehow. And when you're stuck that match, all you're thinking about is like, how do I get to even? And then you turn it into a positive. And most of the time you don't get to even, it just gets you into a worse depth when you're playing stuck. Um, um, it's the worst time to play poker, but it was the craziest session I ever had. Okay, Rocky asks, it seems like this offense requires a specific kind of wide receiver. What traits are you guys looking for when adding wide receiver in the draft or free agency next season? So it's always great to have a physical wide receiver, somebody who has all the athletic traits you need. Change of direction, lateral agility, speed, acceleration, ability to really explode off the line of scrimmage and not give his intentions away. It looks like he's going vertical, but then he stops on a curl or he cuts inside on dig, something like that. But to get, I guess, a little bit more um, specific, I really think, and we've brought this up so many times, so I don't like to beat a dead horse. The intelligence is huge here. Just having spatial awareness, I think, versus zone coverage. I think that's one reason why we've seen Isaiah Hodgins had so much success. I think that, and because he is so deceptive as a route runner. He's not necessarily the most explosive. He's not necessarily the fastest, but his ability to sell breaks and things of that nature has really allowed him to gain the, enough leverage to create separation to allow Daniel Jones to deliver him the football. We saw that basically ever since he arrived with the New York Giants and played against the Houston Texans. So I think spatial awareness is one. And I also think just all of the athletic traits that you're going to be looking for in terms of just playing the wide receiver position, which a lot of 
modern NFL wide receivers have. But I just think you really need to be smart to to understand the playbook, to know how to run routes, not even just to uncover against zone coverages, but also just to just to know what your route is supposed to be based on what the defense is running. Because I think that is another thing, those choice type of routes we talked a lot about in the preseason. So really intelligence would be the number one trait that I'm looking for other than just the baseline athletic traits. Yeah, I think those are, I mean, that's something Joe Shane has also made abundantly clear he's looking for. For me, I would say, I'll answer this question in two separate ways. One, what I think the Giants need at the wide receiver position, and one, what I would look for at wide receiver. The most important traits for me at wide receiver are two things. It's one, release package off the line of scrimmage and ability to release clean off the line of scrimmage. And two, what Nick referenced earlier, the ability to throttle down and get in and out of your breaks. If you have those two traits in spades, if you're really good at those two things, that's where we see the best receivers come from. Antonio Brown is the best example of this, of any wide receiver ever. He was not, he was a six round draft pick. He was not the fastest receiver ever. He was not the biggest receiver ever. He was not the most physical receiver ever. None of those things. He had none of what you really think are the best traits to have. He did have burst. But outside of the burst, he didn't really have much. But he had incredible ability to release clean off the line of scrimmage and create separation. And more importantly, I thought, to get in and out of his breaks. And that when you can when you can throttle down and create separation at the top of your break, you're unguardable at that point. There's no way to guard you without pass interference. And so those are the traits that I look for when I'm evaluating any wide receiver. But what I look for for the Giants and what they should add, to me, what comes to mind most importantly is speed. Especially if they let Darius Slayton walk and hit free agency. They need to have speed. If you're one of these rosters, like the Chargers were last year, where you have no threat of speed at any point, the defenses can play you in such a different and condensed way, and it really impacts everything you do. You need to have these guys like the John Rosses, the Darius Slaytons, who can go over the top, and then you need to take shots to them over the top early in games, I think. I think every first, first quarter should should require, if I'm an offensive quarter, I want to take a deep shot every first quarter. I don't care if it requires me to use a seven-man protection and rip a ball into a coverage that doesn't look that good, but at least put it toward the sideline where it could at worst go incomplete. I just want to make these defenses guess and think and make these corners say, all right, I got to play a little further off the ball on this receiver. All right, the safety say, I, I got to worry a little bit about this ball going deep. And the only way to do that is to get speed on the field. I thought that was the biggest issue for the Chargers, and that's just one team this year. The Ravens had major issues with that as well, to the point where they had to really legitimately think themselves, all right, we got to resign a, uh, we got to sign a player like Deshaun Jackson, who had like nothing left just for the mere fact that they needed to add speed to that wider, to that pass game. Um, so speed is a big one that I think the giants need. Yeah. Jalen Hyatt coming out of Tennessee. He's a wide receiver to monitor who has yep. speed in spades. So keep that name within your draft lexicon. All right. Last question. Kurt asks, Given that the roster is unstable at this point and looking at slate of games on tap for next season seems like a difficult schedule. How optimistic are you that the team will improve or duplicate success next season? I know it's a little bit unfair given the changes coming, but it's an interesting kind of topic to discuss possible step back of this team. Yeah, Kurt. Uh, I feel like you're setting this one up and we're going to at least hopefully Nick has a more optimistic opinion coming, but you're setting me up for a negative, uh, a pessimistic opinion to end the pod, which is never a fun way to end it. But let's take a look at the 2023 opponents first. They have, we don't have to do division ones, but at home, they're going to have the Packers at home, the Jets at home, the Patriots at home, and the Jets at home is a waste of a home game, by the way. So that's like a nothing. I hate to see that. I was hoping the Jets game would be considered away, but Packers at home, Jets at home, Patriots at home, Rams at home, Seahawks at home on the road outside of division. It's going to be Saints. In New Orleans, not a great place to play. Raiders in Vegas, that depends on what they do at quarterback. Cardinals, who knows when they play them. I'm hoping that game is like week one or week two, so Kyler Murray won't be playing. But if he is, that sucks. Niners, Dolphins, Bills. So they go from playing the AFC South, which they were 4-0 against, to playing the AFC East, which is a chance to be the best division in football, potentially, right? The, pay, uh, the Bills are going to be there. The Jets, if they get Rodgers or if they get a, a quarterback, are going to be a tougher team to play. The Dolphins, if two is healthy, are going to be a tough team to play. And then finally, the Patriots are never an easy win. Then they have the 49ers on their schedule. They didn't play the 49ers this year. Um, they the played NFC the, West. The NFC the West. Entire, right, versus the, versus the NFC North, which had teams like the Bears, right? Easy win versus the Bears. The Lions, which wasn't an easy win, they lost. But the Packers weren't a great team this year either. So I think the schedule is a lot tougher. 
realistically, I think the Giants, I, I said the Giants will win nine games this past year. That was my prediction. They ended up winning, what, nine games at the end. But they had to buy yeah. uh, they had the tie. So I, I said nine and eight. I think they ended up being nine, seven and one. So I was close. But I said in my prediction that schedule was one of the reasons why I thought they would win nine games. This schedule is a lot tougher. They don't get the easy four wins against the AFC South. I'm going to go with seven wins would be my early prediction, but let's see how the off season plays out, right? Like there's a chance the giants make big moves in free agency. That would change my opinion. Or more importantly, they get players in this draft that I can get really excited about that hit the ground running and training camp that you see in preseason are starting to really make an impact. Let's say it's a receiver or something like that. They could trade for a Brandon. I agree. You just don't know. It's still too early to say, but I would say it right now I'm, I'm leaning towards seven. Yeah, I'm not going to make a prediction in terms of how many wins they're going to have, but it does appear like they could have a step back. Look, the Giants were uber efficient on offense and defense, and efficiency doesn't always carry over year after year. You need the team to kind of progress, and that can easily happen in free agency or through the draft. But I don't think it's unrealistic to assume that the Giants, because development and winning, the, the trajectory is not always ascending, could have a slight step back because they won so many close games last year and because they're not going to beat up on the AFC South. Instead, they have to play the Bills. The Patriots more than likely going to be better. The Dolphins, depending on what's going on with Tua's situation. And I think another really important factor here, which could help the Giants win some games next year, is they got to freaking win some division games. They had one division yeah. win against Washington. It got swept by Dallas, swept in three games by Philadelphia, and then tied Washington in another game. You have to win in your division. And if the Giants can do that, maybe they can replicate the success this season. But I don't really think this is a certainty that they're going to build on their nine wins. They could have a slight step back depending on what happens. Still so much to play out, though. And that's a good point, too, with the division, because there's a chance the Cowboys can take a step back given yeah. you know their salary cap situation going into this and the, the players they may have to cut to make room. They're obviously going to have draft picks as well. But I will say this as far as, look, there's it just if I'm saying right now, I think they might win two fewer games. It's not to say that they took that much of a step back. could just be sim- as simple as the schedule was harder. And that's just the reality of the situation. It's such a small sample size every year that we're valuing these teams on 17 games. And at the same time, in addition to the fact that, look, the schedule is a little bit tougher, there is the Giants did get a in some ways, let's be honest, a little bit lucky with turnovers. The interceptions, I'm not saying. Like, that was a good job by Daniel Jones. But the fumbles, right? Like, the Giants didn't lose any fumbles this year, and they had plenty of fumbles. They lost the one fumble in the Jones run against Washington. No, I know that. But but I'm just saying, man, like, look, Tennessee, Randy Bullock misses that field goal. That could easily go the other way. Jacksonville, you had the fumble with Travis Etienne, and then you had Christian Kirk get tackled at the one-yard line. Like, it's it shouldn't be controversial to say that the Giants – that's what I'm saying. Really yeah. squeaked out a couple of those wins, right? right? They really squeaked out. And that's what good football teams do, but that doesn't always carry over. This is the NFL. It's not like other football teams are just purely bad. Like everybody right. is a professional, dude. And I think Brian Dable will have this team put into the best position to succeed, but that doesn't mean in those key huge moments the Giants are always going to rise to the occasion. So, it could be a slight step back. I don't think that's unreasonable to say. Yeah, I was agreeing with you because I'm saying like the even the ETN thing you brought up, like not only the Giants get lucky with their own fumbles that they recovered a, a crazy amount of, but then they also had some very timely, like you said, the ETN fumble, some very timely fumbles that they recovered too in that sense as well. And like you could, I don't want to bring the Kayvon Thibodeau fumble into it against the Ravens because that was just a really good defensive play. But the ETN play, was that really that good of a defensive play? Or was it a really poor job by ETN to secure the ball as he's walking into the end zone, right? That's seven points, a seven point swing there in a game that ended because, you know, they almost, they got to the goal line and couldn't get over the, the Jaguars. So there is some fumble luck that will probably won't go the Giants way next year, but they'll, there will be ways for them to overcome that too. If they can take this offense, this passing game to a new level, that changes everything as well. And that makes them a more consistent team that can win games. So it's not to say that this is settled by any means. There's still a full off season. So we don't know what the roster is going to look like, but it's definitely not. It, there's definitely a chance this team could take a step back. Yeah, a chance. And I don't think that's crazy to say, man. But yeah. this was a fun, this was a fun mailbag trio, brother. Yes. Yes. Fun, fun time. Always doing the mailbag. A lot of content coming rest of the week, rest of the year. Keep it locked and loaded because it's the off season. That's a very fun time to, to do this. So to do, to run this podcast, at least from our end. So we hope you enjoy it as well. Thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you soon.